Okay, uh, good afternoon. For some of the new faces here, this is very loud. Um, my name is Charles Small. I'm the director of the Yale Initiative for the Interdisciplinary Study of Antisemitism. Um, we run a seminar series on both Thursdays, and you can find us on, our, on the website for the seminar list. Shah, who was in power since 1941 to 79, 
and uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, who took over in 79. While the Shah was trying to uh, move Iran towards westernization, pro-Western, uh, to, to base Iran on policy of, of Persian culture, the nationalism, nation state, uh, the Islamic Revolution is going all the way to the other side, to a kind of supranational ideology, Islamization, uh, distancing itself from the West, and uh, while the Shah was, had, had great, good relations with Israel, the, the Islamic Revolution views Israel the enemy of mankind uh, with the slogan that Israel should be destroyed and eliminated. Obviously, the, de the developments in Iran and the changes in, in Iran had their impact on the religious minorities, which have been touched, uh, affected by the development in two ways. First, as, as citizens of Iran, the, the, the influence of the revolution was very clear, uh, in, uh, had its clear impact on the life of the religious minorities. Uh, the most uh, obvious case was the Baha'i minority, who suffered more than any other of the minorities, uh, but then the Jews, the Christians, and the other minorities of Austrians, who enjoyed a great deal of liberties under the Shah's rule, came to realize uh, some difficulties under the Islamic revolution. So basically, the religious minorities were affected twice. Once, as citizens of Iran, like any of the Muslim compatriots, the revolution had its influence on their life. And second, as members of religious minority, the revolution had particular impact uh, on them. What I will try to do in this uh, uh, talk today is to, to see the manner in which the both regimes, the monarchy and the Islamic revolution, viewed uh, the, the, the Jews as a minority. And I uh, emphasize only the Jews, although the other minorities had sometimes similar experience, sometimes more, sometimes better, but the topic deals with, with Iran and anti-Semitism. Uh, the Jews of Iran, Iran were the largest Jewish minority in any of the Muslim countries of the Middle East before the revolution. Between 80 and 90,000 Jews lived in Iran in 1979. But surprisingly, even today, there are more Jews living in Iran, with all the talks about nuclear Iran and Iranian threat, and the Israel views Iran as the major threat, existential threat, and every day we wake up and hearing about the Iranian threat, but still, there are more Jews living in Iran today, I believe, that in the entire Muslim world combined. Which is so some of the uh, particular characteristic of the Jewish minority in Iran that continue to be faithful to the Iranian state and they prefer to live in Iran, although those who, could, who wanted, wished to leave the country could have left the country. But still, 25,000 Jews and more are living in Iran. It's more than Turkey has, Egypt, or all, all the Arab countries combined, or even, I would say, even all the Muslim countries combined. So we are speaking about a minority which is not big in numbers, but still, compared with the Muslim Middle East, uh, it is a sizable uh, minority in, in, in Iran. For the Jews of, of Israel, for the people of Israel, uh, Iran is being remembered mostly not by the Iranian threat, but very positively in two different periods. One going back to 2,500 years ago, remembering Cyrus the Great and the Declaration of Liberties for the Jews, we allowed them to go back and rebuild the temple. And then, uh, 20 to 25 centuries later, the golden era of the Jews of Iran under Muhammad Reza Shah. Basically, if you ask Iran, Israelis about the life of the Jews in Iran, the picture will be, the image is, is, is positive. Ignoring the period uh, between Cyrus the Great and Muhammad Reza Shah, that it, has, it has ups and downs, sometimes they have better life. Most of the time, there was persecution of the Jews in Iran that uh, not, uh, I think, people of Israel were not aware of them even. It, unfortunately, the study of the Jews of, of, of Iran is lacking in, in Israel and outside Israel. And not many people know about different developments in the life of the Jews, uh, including, for example, you know, forced con conversion of religion is very rare in the world of Islam, but it exist, did exist in in Iran in 1839 with this, uh, uh, forcing the Jews of Hashem 
uh, to convert to Islam. And if you go even to Great Neck or Los Angeles now and go to the synagogue on Saturday, you may well hear in Mashhadi synagogues that a Jew is being called to read the Torah by the name of Abdel Aziz or Abdel Hamid or whatever, Abdullah, uh, Islamic name. So the people who live as Muslims uh, outside and as Jews inside. And this is one example of the harsh uh, treatment of the Jews in Iran. We have pogroms in, in Tabriz and other parts uh, in the part, other parts of Iran. Bernard Lewis, in his book, The Jews of Islam, when he uh, finishes his discussion of the Jews of Iran and moves to the Ottoman Empire, he makes a very revealing statement saying that compared with the Jews of I I Iran, the Jews of the empire, uh, Ottoman Empire lived in the paradise. So uh, compared to the Arab world, compared to the Sunni world, the Jews of Iran had usually harsher realities throughout history. I could read to many of the statements of observers who have been in Iran in the 18th, 19th century, before and after. Uh, the picture that they portray is very gloomy. I put it in my written version of the paper that I presented this uh, initiative to the Senate Institute. So I don't want to go over them, but believe me, what we see from observers who have witnessed uh, the realities of life in Iran, the situation is very, uh, very bad. And i just read one sentence from the Hungarian uh, Jewish Orientalist, uh, Bamberi. In the mid 19th century, you say, I don't know any more miserable, helpless, and pitiful individual on God's earth than the Yahud in those countries. He visited Iran and Central Asia. And the situation is, in most uh, cases, in most parts of the history of Iranian Jews, in modern history, it's a very suppressive, very uh, gloomy situation of the Jews of Iran. Why it was so? Probably because Iran is far distant from the West. Uh, the realities in Iraq were not known in the West. Uh, Egypt and the Ottoman Empire, uh, uh, Istanbul were closer to the West. And so, and, and Shia Islam in many ways is much more uh, uh, extremist in its attitudes to religious minorities and to non-Muslims. One issue just to mention is the concept of the uh, uh, impurity, uh, ritual impurity of, of non-Muslims, of Jews. And we know that the, the Jews in Iran in the 19th century even could not go outdoors when it was raining or snowing uh, because the Jew was regarded as najes, as uh, unclean, and the water could have washed the dirt from his body and uh, make the earth and the water uh, dirty. Uh, these issues of impurity was revived later on by Khomeini, and come to it later, but the concept did exist in, in Iran uh, in, in the 19th century, even in the 20th century. When I lived in Iran two years and was doing study, uh, or my, or collecting material for my PhD thesis, uh, the woman who was taking care of our young daughter did not use our dishes while she didn't eat and drink from our dishes, she did all the glass and all. This is part of her way to uh, maintain its religious duties. And she explained to me it's part of, we are cautious, she is cautious, everything is okay, but as long as it was individual, that's fine. But when it was moved from this individual behavior to inciting people to regard the other as, as unclean, it was, it was something, something else. Beginning of change was the late 19th century, early 20th century, roughly around the Constitutional Revolution, even earlier. And this was basically, I think, due to different developments inside Iran and the growing contact between Iran and the West. When the, when the European Jewry leaders of the Jews in the West started to uh, show interest in the life of the Jews of Iran, Moses Montefiore and others uh, in contact with Iran. When the Alliance School was established in Iran and different Iranian cities, uh, and the liberal movement in the around late 19th century, the, the constitutional revolution, uh, which can see the beginning of change in, in Iran, and it was further accelerated with the Balfour Declaration and the growing of the Zionist movement uh, in Europe, in Palestine, that gave some uh, encouragement and heart to the Jews of Iran as, as well. 
under the modern key of the Pahlavi kind of regime, we can see significant change in improvement in the life of the Jews uh, in Iran, getting out of the, of the Mahale, of the ghetto in which they live, uh, starting to go frequent the schools more than uh, uh, ever before, uh, the jizya, the poor tax, uh, they didn't have to pay anymore, and we can see gradual improvement of the life of the Jews of Iran, although there mean with this liberty some difficulties when you go out of your neighborhood, out of your ghetto, there is a, a challenge of how you mix with the non-Jews, and how you keep your religious duties, you could build synagogues, and so on and so forth, but altogether we can see development that reached its peak in the 60s and 70s, uh, in the peak of the pie of the rule of Muhammad Reza Shah, which I would call as uh, the golden era of the Jews of Iran. And I lived in Iran in two years, I observed and looked at the life of the Jews of Iran. They had almost the same freedoms as the Iranians, uh, other Iranians said. They said freedom, said that not, they did have really freedom, but compared to the Muslims, there was no much difference. They could be, in a way, even the Jews had that advantage because they were the Shah believed they, they cannot be communist, they, they are always faithful, and the, the treatment of the Jews was, was fair. And I heard some Jews even calling the Pahlavi king, his family name is Pahlavi, they calling him Papa Levi, he was so uh, kind, kind and nice, nice to the Jews. All this was changed with the change of regime with the Islamic Revolution. And with the Islamic Revolution, mainly during the revolutionary process, there have been some attacks on, on Jews, pamphlets being distributed, uh, uh, reminding them of Hitler, reminding them of the, what they can be done to the Jews. And uh, it's not a governmental or Khomeini's initiative. I don't think it was uh, something that has been organized from above. But individuals or groups within society that had some account to settle with the Jews or with the individual Jews were behind this kind of incitement and power uh, against, against the Jews. It is a very crucial period in the transition from the monarchy to the Islamic Revolution. But even under the Islamic Revolution, uh, we can see some signs of uh, anti-Jewish statements that had their origins in the religious uh, studies of, of, of the, the top clergy in Iran and statements by other groups uh, in, in the country. If we take, for example, Ayatollah Khomeini's uh, philosophy and his writings, uh, you can see in, uh, so many cases in which there are statements which are very clearly against the Jews. In his opening page of his book, uh, al hukuma Islamiya or velayat e in, in Persian, uh, the book that was published in the late, very late 60s, uh, I'll read you the paragraph from the first page. Since, the, since its inception, Islamic movement has been afflicted with the Jews, for it was they who first established anti-Islamic propaganda and joined in various uh, strategies against, 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 against the Prophet. And he goes on and say that uh, the, the Jews, uh, we see today, that Khomeini says at the time, we see today that the Jews have made certain changes in the Quran they have, been, they have printed in the occupied territories. We must protest and make the people aware that the Jews and their foreign masters are opposed to the very fundamentals of Islam and wish to establish Jewish domination throughout the world. These are only a few paragraphs you can read the statements of Khomeini, uh, many, many uh, uh, paragraphs that basically uh, in, in the same line. He also revived this issue of the uh, impurity of the Jews, going to, into details. For example, if, uh, if a Jew converts to Islam, would he be uh, clean or unclean? If his body wets, is the sweat? is clean or unclean, or not just, or not just, or kind of, 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 of uh, such statements. However, in due time of the transition from opposition to power, we can see the authorities in Iran, the leaders of Iran, being much more careful to make distinction between Jews and Zionism in Israel. I don't know how far it can be done, but uh, 
they tried very much not to speak against the Jews of Iran. Khomeini said many things against the Jews of Iran. He collaborated with the Shah against the interests of the Iranian nation before he came back to Iran in August. But when he became the supreme leader of the country, he did not uh, repeat it. Although there have been some slips of tongue here and there. For example, in one case, he speaks about the Christians, that they are even worse than the Jews, he said, if there is at all something is his, which is worse than the Jew, and he's retreated immediately and said, I mean the Jews of Israel. So it, it is uh, playing with this uh, Jewish and Zionist Jews and Israel is very uh, clear. Uh, trying to make distinction between Jews, which are okay, and Zionists, which is not. But often enough, speaking about Zionists, they mean Jews and vice versa. For example, how can one speak about the Zionists at the time of the Prophet Muhammad? When they're speaking about the Zionists of the Prophet Muhammad, or the Zionists who made the life of Patriarch Abraham miserable, but certainly he means Jews, he doesn't mean Zionism. Zionism does not exist at that time at all. So the, the, the distinction is very blurred. I want to make this clear that the, I think the distinction between Jews and Zionism is the invention of the Jews of Iran, who came to see Ayatollah Khomeini immediately after his return to Iran, and to protect themselves, they tried to they convince him that there is a difference between Jews, which are okay. We are Jews, but we are not political Jews, we are not Zionists. Khomeini bought this formula, but it's very difficult to follow this kind of line. For example, when the, the, the former leader of the Iranian Jewish community, uh, al qadayan was executed, he was the first civilian Iranian executed in May 1979, uh, I mean civilian non-official uh, Iranian executed. Uh, they say that the Jewish milliardaire was executed and he was blamed to have really, uh, close contact with the Zionist state. So basically, you could have accused many people in Iran to be Zionist if having any contact with Israel is a criteria to decide who is Zionist and who, who is a Jew. But this formula has been accepted and still being followed in Iran. Uh, and you could see it even in the, in the series of uh, 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 television series that was broadcast until this week uh, that trying to make this very distinction. Uh, so it's uh, very difficult to say that what is the attitude of the leadership in the, of Iran towards the Jews uh, per se. Uh, officially speaking, again, they refrain from accusing the Jews, but from time to time they make action that it's very clearly anti-Jewish, against the Jewish community in Iran. For example, six, seven, seven years ago, they arrested 13 Jews in Shiraz and they blaming them for espionage, but it was very clear to all of them that none of them was, had anything to do with spying. And I think that the admission that they were not spies was given by the court in Iran. They, they uh, jailed them for two years. If you put someone in jail for two years, he is not a traitor, he is not a spy. If he is a spy, he gets harsher treatment under the Islamic Republic. And they were consequently released. But the fact that they take collectively 13 people and blaming them to be unfaithful to Iran and being faithful to Israel, it's, uh, it's again a, a kind of accusation that could have been applied towards uh, many, many more in Iran. To make sure there are more than one voice, one, one attitude in Iran, Iran is a very diversified country with pluralistic attitudes to almost every and each issue. Uh, there are people who are more radical, conservative, extremists. On the other hand, there are people who are more reformist, uh, uh, pragmatic. You can see it in almost each and every case. Unfortunately, in the West, this kind of dichotomy, with the internal rifts within the Iranian society, is not being expressed. Basically, what we see that if the picture is all black, the Iranians want to convince us that everything in Iran is white. But I think that the picture is more in between the Iran gray areas, there are different, uh, different attitudes. And on each and every issue, I think that if you take, for example, in Iran, the press in Iran, which is very uh, interesting to read, the newspapers, the book publications, since it is with uh, this, uh, today an, an article by uh, Ahmad Ganji writing about Iran and fascism, and basically he, he wrote a book uh, by the name of the fascist interpretation of religion blaming the Iranian government to be fascist. Of course he went to jail. 
But the book was published in Tehran. Other people published other books, very critical. One of the top lead uh, intellectuals in Iran, of Sen Kaliva, wrote an article. The title was, The Problem Number One of Iran is the Rule of the Clergy. And of course, he went to jail, he came back, he continued to struggle. And, uh, and I was speaking of this in, in Israel some time ago, uh, a few years ago, about this press and, and, and the freedom, the suppression of freedom. And, and an Israeli official asked me how you can speak about uh, freedom of expression in Iran and 100 newspapers that were shut down in five years. But my immediate response was, show me another country in the Middle East which has 100 liberal newspapers to shut them down. The fact that 100 of them exist means there is some degree of uh, freedom of expression, but there is no freedom because they close them, they put them, the editors are in jail. So, so it's very difficult to see what is the real picture. I was speaking with a friend of mine as a professor in one of the Iranian universities about this dichotomy and the differences between uh, different trends within Iran. And he told me, you know, David, they tell you there is no freedom of expression in, in Iran. That's not true. We have freedom of expression. What we don't have is freedom after expression. <laughs> so it is, uh, it is, on one side, you see people who really express themselves. They pay the price. They go to jail. On the other hand, you have the revolutionary guards. You have the supreme leader. You have the people that we call conservatives who speak in the name of God, who have the support of the military, the revolutionary guard, and who are determined to keep power. So this. These different trends are, can be shown in their attitude if you compare the presidency of Khatami to the presidency of Ahmadinejad. Khatami was the figurehead, the leader of this reform trend. And uh, not that under Khatami, the Jews, uh, the treatment of the Jews, of expression of uh, anti Semitism totally disappeared, but there have been a more balanced attitude among intellectuals when speaking about freedom. Uh, of civil rights in the country, including rights of the, of the uh, uh, religious minorities. At the same time, after uh, under Khatami, it was the time that the voices of denial of Holocaust became so prominent in Iran. And under the same Khatami that allowed more uh, freedoms or were tolerant to greater freedoms, uh, the uh, denial of Holocaust in Iran did not begin under uh, under uh, Ahmadinejad. It was basically, the, the peak of it was under uh, uh, Khatami, and it was immediately after the trial of Roger Garoudi in France, and his invitation to Iran, giving him all the platform to go to university to speak and meeting the supreme leader of Iran, the president of Iran, and all these kind of theories that uh, the Holocaust, uh, well, if not at that time, they didn't say it a myth, but at least they, they, they claim that uh, all the, 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 the all discussion of the Holocaust is the creation of the Jewish people to legitimize the creation of the state of Israel. And if at all there is a Holocaust, it is the Holocaust of the Palestinians and the Zionists are wars that, and the, 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 the Nazis. And these ideas were, were in Iranian press by Iranian officials uh, much before Ahmadinejad became president. So it is easy to say the world that are some extremists and they continue with this extremism. I think that it, it, it is visible in Iran regardless of Ahmadinejad. The caricatures against the Jews exist all over. And you can see the translation of the protocols of the elderly of Zion into Persian today more than the translation into Arabic. In the Iranian newspapers, you can see segments of the protocols of the elderly of Zion being published uh, in, in hundred segments sometimes in the leading Iranian newspapers. The book publication in Iran, uh, the books are, so many books are being published in Iran, but including several very anti-Jewish, uh, anti-Semite Semite books, including so-called scholarly studies about the Holocaust, of course they all come to the conclusion that there was no Holocaust, the Holocaust is a myth. And uh, although few Jews have been killed during the war, but they all died before during the war, but this was because of disease and all kinds of diseases that other people were killed. There was no any scheme to uh, uh, get rid of the Jews and so on and so forth. Uh, under Ahmadinejad, this became uh, more. Uh, this uh, idea became much more 
prominent in the statements, but it was mainly, it's not the idea, the idea is not new, the whole thing that is being said today has been said five, ten years ago. And it's the volume of, uh, of the, uh, and the, the uh, frequency of the statements, and the fact that they come from the president of the state, I think makes some kind of difference between what we see today and what we have seen in the past. I belong to those people who don't think that Ahmadinejad is single-handedly leading the country. I don't think that he, uh, it's only one person show. Uh, in Iran, we can see trends moving from one side to the other. And I think that in the last few years, there is a growth of power of the, of the more conservative or neoconservative element in Iran. After the victory of the, in the presidency of Khatami in 1997, and the victory of the prime, his followers in the municipal election in 1999, and the victory of his followers in the parliamentary elections of 2000, we could see the 2003, the local elections was won by the conservatives, 2004, the parliamentary elections were won by the cons conservatives, and 2005, Ahmadinejad became uh, president. And he made his Holocaust uh, issue such a prominent issue in his state. Uh, speaking about Holocaust as a myth, uh, a legend, if you want, uh, that uh, there is no basis in history. And uh, paradoxically, say, so well, that if there was a Holocaust, uh, the, uh, when speaking about the Palestinians, they speak that there is a Holocaust uh, to the Palestinians. There was not, nothing like a Holocaust in Europe, it's exaggeration by the Jews. But not all the people who speak about the Holocaust deny the Holocaust. It's not pure denial of Holocaust. Trivializing the Holocaust, belittling its significance, shedding the light, uh, uh, some, uh, uh, questioning uh, the, uh, the Holocaust as a fact, and so on and so forth. We can see it so, so many, many times in Iran, repeated by many people, including uh, people that we consider to be uh, to be uh, 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 more more pragmatic. There are, I must admit, some people who think differently. Ahmadinejad organized in 2006 a contest of caricatures uh, about the Holocaust. Now, it is the same Muslim world that was so infuriated by the caricature published in Denmark, initiates the uh, contest of caricatures in Iran about the Holocaust. Uh, you can, it's on the website, you can go and see uh, how ugly they are, but uh, uh, it was with the blessing of the president of the state. And then with the blessing of the president of the state and his participation, Holocaust denial conference held in Tehran in last December. Uh, the problem of this kind of statement is that the people in Iran, even if they are not anti-Semite or they don't doubt the Holocaust, they don't have any other way to understand what happened in World War II. A child in elementary or secondary school in Iran doesn't have any access to any, uh, any fact about uh, the atrocities of World War II and what happened to the Jews. So this kind of statement, repeated by the top leadership of Iran, may influence ignorant people, ignorant people who don't know the facts, and convince them that really the Holocaust was a myth. There are other people in Iran, though, who I must say that I admire their voice being raised in Iran, challenging the president and challenging the government for making such statements. And this is, I think, the hope for Iranians, is that they still have such people like the students, intellectuals, professors, who dare to challenge and pay the price. I read your statement by one of the professors in one of the Iranian universities. It was published in Iran itself. And he, said, he says, this professor, as an Iranian, I'm perplexed and astonished by the actions of our foreign minister. The foreign minister was behind the, uh, the conference on the Holocaust last December. I don't know what is honor of gathering a group of anti-Semites, neo-Nazis, complex uh, class clan members, and racists, and bring them to Iran, and for what? And this is happening at a time when, when our nuclear case is in the UN, and we have to do our best 
to get the trust of the international community. This is one example. There are other examples uh, that the people who raise their voice and speak to the contrary of the official line. But the official line is the governmental line that we see that President uh, Ahmadinejad making such statements, very uh, vocal statements, uh, endorsing such ideas about the Holocaust, questioning the uh, accuracy of, of the stories of, of the Holocaust, and uh, propagating these ideas. Recently, and in the last year, I've, seen, I've received uh, around 10 books, new books published in Iran about the Holocaust. All of them in the same line. All of them supposedly under, is under research institutions having the same basically pattern of questioning or putting question mark on the Holocaust if it exists. Uh, and of course, their line is, is, is very clear. I can understand why Ahmadinejad makes such statements. Uh, his radical views, not only about the Holocaust, but again about uh, other, about the West, about Israel, about the need to wipe out Israel out of the map, uh, they made him to be a recognized leader of Iran in many ways. He was an unknown persona in Iran before he was elected. He was hardly even to have president. Uh, mayor of Tehran, all of a sudden he is the president, he is very shrewd and sophisticated, and I think he is using his radicalism to establish himself as, uh, as a leader. And in fact, uh, shortly after he became president, he started these statements, he is now known all over the world. Three years ago, I, I bet no one of you have heard the name of Ahmadinejad, now every child in the world, I think, knows about Ahmadinejad. He takes advantage of the way of American problems in Iraq. Uh, he, uh, to raise such ideas, he feels strong because of the oil price. There are other reasons for him to continue with his, uh, with his line. And I think the basic thing is that he believes in what he says. I think people should take him very seriously because when he speaks about whatever he speaks, he really is very sincere in his belief. At least one should give him the credit that when he says something, he really means something, and it's about time that we will take the Iranians much more seriously than we have done in the last uh, decades or so. Now, uh, the question in Iran is therefore not why the president is making such statements. In Iran, the president is not the head of the state. So the question is why Khamenei and why others are allowing him to make such statements. Well, partly, I think, because they share such views with him. I don't think that Khamenei is entirely against what Ahmadinejad says about the West, about Israel, even about the Holocaust. Uh, we could see some of his stuff when he met Gaudi in 1998. Uh, uh, but uh, to be honest with you, if I was Khamenei, I would have loved to have Ahmadinejad next to me. Ahmadinejad has made all the Iranian conservatives look moderate. When you, I read an uh, uh, article in, in the Time magazine uh, some time ago, and it, the whole article was uh, uh, how Ahmadinejad is moderate and pragmatic. The only one who could have made Khamenei look pragmatic is Ahmadinejad. So it's basically, uh, they let him go on. I think that recently there is an attempt to uh, to, to try and lower his rhetoric. And I think if you compare his statements in 2006 with his statement in 2007, you will see that in 2007, he was less vocal, less radical than in 2006. It's not a big difference, but there is a difference. And I have to need to pressure on him from inside, inside the country. Uh, so recently there have been, have another five minutes? There have, been, there have been a series that I mentioned uh, in Iranian television uh, about the Holocaust. So many people in the West were so happy. Here is Iran showing a 30 segments program uh, broadcast in Iran about the Holocaust. It means that they confess and they admit that the Holocaust did exist. But whoever views this program can, can see how shrewdly they are trying to distinguish between the good Jews and the bad Jews, the Jews and the Zionists. 
And this theme is repeated in his, in his, uh, in his movie series that I think is the most expensive movie series, uh, television series produced by the Iranian television in recent years. They put so much money to produce a, a series on the Holocaust out of all issues. I think it shows also the obsession with this issue in, in Iran. The main, the main theme in this film is that to obscure the lines between Jews and Zionists and all to, to try and, pr and make the point that uh, the Islamic Republic is only against the Zionists but not against, against the Jews. The best example that I have seen of this distinction is uh, an article published in Jumhuri Islami, uh, I think almost 20 years ago. Uh, the article was uh, written by a professor of uh, Tehran University, Amir Tarakolka Muzia. And it is, this is one of the harshest or one of the most uh, uh, satanic statements against the Jews that I could see it written in Persia. The article is full of accusations against the Jews from beginning to end, from the days of Abraham to Freud and homosexualism and everything bad in the world <coughs> Uh, is in their eyes is is because of the Jews. I won't read it to you, but I want to say in the the, the editor the editors have put a note in this article, and the note says, well, I, maybe I read it to you. It may be needless to say so, but in fact, it is clear from the content that the professor is using the term Jew, when, when the professor is using the word Jew, it is, is not, he's not speaking of the pious followers of the religion. The professor explicitly and frankly distinguishes between Zionists and Jews. I mean, what he says in the, uh, later, on, later on is that they advise the people to replace the word Jews wherever it's, it's, it is in the long article with Zionists. I mean, actually, they write the whole story against the Jews, and then the editorial note says, whenever you see in this article the word Jew, replace it with Zionists, because this was the intention of the author. Whoever reads the article can see very clearly that the author, this professor, makes, he knows exactly while when he speaks about Zionists and when he speaks about Jews. Certainly when he speaks about the Jews being enemies of the Prophet Muhammad in the seventh century, he certainly did not mean the Zionists of being against the Prophet Muhammad. But at all is the mind of the Iranian people is like a computer that you can give an order, replace A with B, replace Jews and Zionists. When they read the material, they read what they read. It's influenced them. But this I think this Editorial note made it clear to me that this kind of policy of sowing the seeds of animosity, but not going one step further to attack uh, the Jews of Iran uh, at all. I must, must admit that the Jews of Iran enjoy significant liberties today in Iran. They can fragment their synagogues. Uh, on the contrary, they will be encouraged to, uh, to go to synagogue. The synagogues are full of people, basically because this is the only venue in which they can gather and meet it and, and uh, discuss things between themselves. So the, the, the picture is very unclear. What, what's clear what they say about the Jew, the Jews of the world, the world the, uh, about Israel. When it comes to the Jews of Iran, the situation is much, much different and there are different attitudes in different times by different people in the revolution. In the historical perspective, I would say that the era of Shah Muhammad Reza Shah for the Jews of Iran was, the, was the, really the golden era of the, of the Jews for many, many centuries. They enjoyed uh, liberties, they, can, they became uh, involved in the economy. Uh, the concept of nation state and Iranian nationalism uh, allowed the Jews to be uh, equal members in the nation, in the nation state. The Islamic Republic moved the whole thing on the other side, and uh, recently, when all the statements about the Holocaust are being uh, uh, mentioned and raised in Iran in such an obsessive way, it comes to newspaper articles, translations of books, publications of supposedly academic works, we can see that the, uh, the animosity towards the Jews 
and unwilling to accept the realities of World War II. The problem with this such attitude is that a whole generation is being brainwashed and implanting in their mind all kinds of ideas about, about the Holocaust, about the Jews, the, the Jews being the real racist of the 20th century. And uh, as, as an Israeli and Iranian by birth, when I read this kind of statement, I really am angry and ashamed at the same time. I, I, I read Arabic world, I read the statement in Arabic, they have basically the same attitudes you can find, denial of Holocaust in Arabic than in Persian, but somehow I think that in the, in, 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 when it comes to the, uh, the Persian language, their attitude is so harsh, and, and uh, denial is coming from the highest authorities in the country, and I think that uh, I can only hope that it will not influence the mind of the young generation in Iran. And I am good looking at the young generation in Iran. I have some kind of hope, seeing their attitudes on so many different issues, that they are not necessarily buying what the Islamic regime is trying to sell them. So there is any hope that these open-minded young people of Iran, that they have done very good things in other issues, in journalism, in use of internet, will be capable of ignoring what this Islamic regime is trying to implant in their mind about the Jews, and about the Jews of the world, about American Jewry, about Zionism, and about Israel. Thank you. So we can open up for questions and answers, and I'll just start by saying thank you very much. Uh, we're inside for 7 o'clock. But my question is, in the study of multiculturalism and incomplete legal philosophy, the treatment, the notion of belonging and otherness is a very integral part of society. The work of Charles Taylor, Bill Kimlicka, Walzer, Emmanuel uh, Venus, and others, this is a key area, uh, a foundational aspect of society. In, in your view, during your lecture, you spoke, I think, about three main periods in terms of uh, Islamic and Iranian relations to Jews. You spoke about Islamic notions and notions of Jewish impurity and fatwas that came down in the 18 and 1900s. And then you spoke about the period of the Holocaust denial, which seems to have started in the 1960s with the rise of radical Islamists and Khomeini and others. And now, more recently, the Holocaust denial and the prominence of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which touch on the most pernicious forms of uh, hatred of Jews. So, given these sort of three periods of anti Jewish belief, how entrenched is this in the society? Is this a top-down, the imams and the Arishawi Fatwas and these radical Islamic uh, leaders are preaching this from the top-down and it's not permeating into the society? Or is the society already sort of prepared in a way and have these sensors to receive it from hundreds of years of uh, these beliefs? And, and then based on your answer, how how serious is the threat of the regime to Israel at this moment? At least ideologically, not militarily, but ideologically. Are they is the society really prepared to carry out this? Well, your first question is uh, very difficult for me to answer. The last time I've been in Iran was just before the Islamic Revolution, and I cannot really judge how much it, uh, this kind of a views have influenced uh, Iranians. And the Iranians, I see, the Iranians who visit the West, uh, so their attitude is not like the average Iranian citizen, people who travel to the world, so I cannot judge by them. I can say what, what I realized in Iran before the revolution. There are some religiously uh, elements that uh, contain anti-Jewish uh, sentiments and views, but all in all, I don't think I realized in Iran this kind of animosity in the 70s towards the Jews. Uh, they don't like foreigners, but um, no nation likes foreigners. But the, the idea that is uh, realizing that the West is penetrating the country and taking its wealth. But it didn't have to do with Jews or others, but it was the concept of the foreigners, of the Khawaji, of people who came from abroad who are uh, exploiting our wealth. Uh, the, Religiously speaking, yes, there were some elements of uh, uh, distancing themselves from Judaism and the 
uh, attitudes toward the Jews that I didn't like, probably they have been strengthened since then. Uh, but I don't really know how much they really penetrate. One can say that 30 years of Islamic rule, and they go to the schools, and in the school textbooks, we have yeah, a new study that in Jerusalem now, they was published recently that to show that the attitude toward the Jews in the textbooks of the Islamic Republic, you can see elements of uh, hatred towards the Jews or uh, misunderstanding or false statements about the Jews in the textbooks. So the textbooks create a new generation of people who have been educated on these uh, uh, stories. But on the other hand, as someone who studied education in Iran, I, I, I'm not sure that whatever is being written in the, in the textbooks would really influence the mind of the children for the long run. The first generation in Iran, it was all, that almost all the children of Iran went to schools in the 60s and 70s, produced the Islamic Revolution against the Shah. And the books, textbooks were full of admiration for the Shah and the pictures of the Shah and the stories about the monarchy and so on. People went different way. I think today the new generation is being educated in Iran. It is more uh, open to the West and not. Uh, and distancing themselves from religion that uh, met in many other countries in, 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 in the Middle East. The fact that there is an Islamic textbook or Islamic regime is producing the textbooks and teaching them version A doesn't mean that ultimately the young people will go and we see signs among the young students if you want, that they are not really following the official line. My fear for this, uh, this Holocaust denial issue, because they don't know, I met recently a friend who is a professor in Iran, and he asked me how many people were killed in the, during the Holocaust. And when I say the figure, I say it accepted in 6 million, but it can be less, it can be more, no one really knows exactly how many. He was astonished, he didn't believe it. He said, but, I said what, what do you think? He said, a few dozens of thousands. And this is someone who is not anti-Semite, who has not anything to do with animosity towards Jews or Israel, uh, and, and I think that because they don't know, and it's coming from such high authorities, there is a danger that it would, uh, it would penetrate. How much it did penetrate, uh, Charles, I, I really don't know. Your other question was about the threat, religious threat, or ideological threat. Well, of course there is a threat of Iranian Islamic revolution to Israel. By the very fact that they view Israel as what well, they call us the, the lesser center, the great center is the United States. Uh, but uh, I don't know whom they, if they blame Israel because Israel is friendly with the United States, or they blame the United States because it's a war for Israel, but both of us are in the same camp of, of the center. <coughs> the problem, the, the danger of the Islamic Revolution in Iran, that it turned the Arab Israeli conflict in, in, to a degree at least from a political national conflict between two uh, national movements into a religious uh, contest between, uh, between Jews and Muslims. And religious conflict is much more difficult to resolve than national conflict. For the Iranians, the problem is not uh, the boundaries of the Jewish state of Israel. The, the, the very existence of Israel is unacceptable. The fact that uh, there are religious uh, reasons for it, they don't recognize the Jews, Judaism as a nationality. Judaism is religion, is faith, is not a nationality. It doesn't have the right to exist at all, certainly not in the Middle East, of course not in Jerusalem with its capital. And if you think religiously, uh, Jews in the best of times, uh, are at best, are being viewed as tolerated minority under Islamic rule. What happened since 1948 and maybe since 1967 is rather than the Jews being tolerant minority under Islamic rule, there are so many Muslims living under Jewish control. This is religiously, ideologically unacceptable. So there is this ideological threat exists, but again, uh, and you ask not to go to this nuclear issue, they won't go into the nuclear issue. I think that, uh, but, the ideology is not is not is insufficient to determine the policy of the country. Now, any ideological movement that I know, at least in my view, upon transition from opposition to power, 
learns pretty soon that it has to recognize realities and adjust dogma to realities. There is no much in, uh, uh, resemblance of Khomeini's ideology of the 60s and 70s in the policy of the Islamic Revolution today. If you look at almost each and every issue, wherever there was a clash between ideology and interest, or national interest as perceived by the ruling elite, interest won over ideology. So all the statements that they have made against uh, many issues, I can see from interest in the banking system, to attitude towards nationalism, to export the revolution, soon enough they retreated from dogma. I don't mean that the revolutionary idea, uh, regime comes to power and the first thing that they want to do is how to retreat from what we promised or from our ideology. They wake up in the morning and they want to do exactly what they promised, but when they realize they have to pay a heavy price, they change their policy. It happened in so many other issues. In the case of Israel, uh, and it's somewhat related to our issue of the, the action of the Jews. In the case of Israel, they don't have ideology. Ideologically, they are against the existence of Israel, and they don't yet have sufficient reason to retreat from their dogma. So therefore, this animosity continues, because they don't lose much from their animosity towards Israel. Uh, this is I, I, what I see It's the ideological uh, uh, challenge of Iran, but it's the, 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 the challenge is not limited to ideology, but it's to support similar-minded uh, uh, movements like Hamas, Hezbollah, Fi, uh, Islamic Jihad. It's ideological or it's practical, I don't know. It's out of ideology, you support uh, a movement that opposes the state of Israel, the existence of the state of Israel. There are uh, the other issue that Iran ideologically has done, it has given life to the life to extremist or radical movements all over the Muslim world. And, and you know, the influence of the Iranian revolution is unmeasurable. No one can really <coughs> measure how much it influenced uh, the people, because it, 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 it influence on the soul of people, on the sentiments of people all over the Muslim world. We can see growing radicalism, ext extremism, all over the Muslim world. But the comfort is that while Muslims have followed more and more this school of thought being coming from Sunni Islam, Shia Islam, uh, I think while the Iranian revolution has given encouragement to Islamism in the, all over the region, it also has put a significant barrier towards their ultimate victory and success. During the Shah's time, there was revolution against him, movement against him. The Shah did not recognize the threat, and the world would not have let him, certainly not President Clinton, okay, Carter, to act against the movement. Today, when there is growing radicalism in the Arab world, the leaders of the Arab world are aware of the threat, responding, and the world, rather than stopping them, is applauding them. Look at what Hafez al-Assad has done in al Hama. Uh, 25 years ago, uh, President of Iraq, Saddam Hussein is done, and other leaders of the Arab world. So on the one side, you can see growing radicalism. On the other side, there are preventive uh, measures taken by the uh, governments of the, of the Middle East. Basically speaking, I think that what we see in the Middle East is the strength of the nation state, which is national, national state is a new phenomenon in the Middle East, is a Western ideology that penetrated and has been so much uh, successful in, in different countries of the Middle East. I mean, Iranian Jews, and uh, I can say whatever you said is absolutely correct. And uh, the question you ask is how much is the government policy and education is going to affect the people? I don't think it's going to affect anything at all. I'll give you an example. Ahmed Nejad, about three days ago, he went to the University of uh, Science and Technology. He was a graduate from there, uh, just happened to be I graduated from there too. So he's about three years of junior on me. So they didn't let any other a student from the university go to hear his speech. And uh, they bus other students from 
that CG, which are government payroll, they brought them over there to this industry. I mean, all of these students in the, the university, they are twins. None of them, all of them were born after the revolution. So it shows it doesn't affect anything to the students and the people because the government doesn't have any credibility. So whatever they said, they don't believe on it because they see he promised them so they're going to live a better life, they're going to give the old money, nothing to me. They have no credibility. And I was born in 1952 and left 1979. I would say during the Shah's regime, we have a more respect from the government than the people of Iran. But right now it's other way around. Iranian Jews get more respect from the people in the street than get it from the government. That's what I must say. I just want to make one question that I think your um, that was the things you said raised is um, why and it, it so it, why why have the Jews in Iran not um, made uh, um, like a mass exodus since the uh, revolution or and if there I mean if there you know since the block why I mean why is there the type of pressure that there was in both the U.S. and the um, and, and in Israel to bring like they're working to, for, for Soviet Jewry. It seems the only people who are really who are really obsessed with bringing um, Iranian Jews to uh, Israel or, or the U.S. are neither the Iranian Jews nor the Israelis, but, but American Christians. So, uh, you... well, why there was not exodus? Uh, the story of Iran is different from the story of the Arab world. After 1948, <coughs> the, uh, the Jews in the Arab world were forced out of their countries and immigrated at mass to Israel. The Jews of Iran, uh, they mostly remain in Iran, although between 1948 and 1951, 25,000 Jews emigrated to Israel, but the vast majority of the Jews of Iran remain in Iran. Uh, and then after 1979, still I think that I would say that two-thirds of the Jews of Iran who lived in Iran before the revolution left since then, left the country. But as I mentioned, 25, 27,000 Jews still live in Iran. The question is why they don't leave the country? Well, I, 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 there's not a simple answer to it. I, I, had to, I asked many of these Iranians why, and the, the, the answers you get is very there are various answers. For example, my husband is buried there and I won't leave the country because my other husband is buried there. How you can respond to this? Uh, this is the only country that I speak the language. I want to die here. My parents have been here. There are all kinds of... And also there is no... Uh, the, the government doesn't give them good reason to feel that they are threatened. Uh, they continue their life like, like the Muslim continue their life. But this... Has, I think that there are... They sense that they are a minority, but they sense they are a minority even under the Shah. As a, maybe you won't agree with me, when I was in Iran and I saw this prosperous, successful Jewish community, and they were they were so scared from the non-Jews, from the Muslims. Uh, even at that time, there was this concern. Of course, today there is a concern. Why they leave, they leave them? We should invite some of them and ask them. I think that. Uh, the, the answer is not simple, uh, but I would use the question to, to ask to raise another point. You know, many Jews left Iran after 79. When I look at the Jews of Iran living in outside the country, I think what a loss for the Iranian nation. It's unbelievable to see the Jews of Iran so successful after one generation in, of living in democratic states, you can see them in Los Angeles, in Great Neck, in Israel, in Europe. In Israel, until recently, we had, well, I don't know if I mentioned the name of the president of the state of Israel, <laughs> <laughs> but 
The chief of staff, father was born in Iran. The minister of defense, now the deputy prime minister, Shaul Mufaz, was born in Iran. The most popular pop music singer of the country was born in Iran. And you can, the, the former chief rabbi of Israel was born, his parents came from Iran. Iranian, Iranian minority or Iranian Jews in Israel have become very powerful, very successful. When I go to Los Angeles and I visit them often, because Los Angeles, you asked me about Iran, Los Angeles is the closest that I can get to Tehran these days. <laughs> uh, so I visit them often and I see the Jews of Iran. The mayor of the Iran is, is an Iranian, the mayor of Beverly Hills is the Iranian Jew. And I see the, the, the education of the children, the occupation of their parents and the children, and, the, and, and, and this prosperity. I think that this is something that happened to the Iranian Revolution, losing so many people. The brain drain was a big punishment for the Iranian nation long before the Islamic Revolution. It became such a punishment after the Islamic Revolution. And I think that um, when you ask why they didn't leave, look at the half empty of the glass. Many left and they are doing good services for the prosperity of other countries rather than doing service to their own nation. We are leaving our apartment under the year now. They can introduce me. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, I want to get back to this question about uh, why it is that the Jews in Iran seem to be not as persecuted as one might expect, and contrast it to some of the other like groups that Iran didn't talk about today, but besides the Jews in Iran. Um, we've had several talks in the seminar series before, which always sort of end up raising the question in whose interest is it to, to have this sort of persecution. So it seems that right now in the world, the Iranians are interested in being the leaders of the Muslim world, not only worried about governing in Iran, but actually being the leaders of the Muslim world, thereby in competition with Saudi Arabia or, or with Egypt, for example. And so, in, in that sense, uh, constant criticism of Israel gives them a lot of points. That's something which seems salient to the uh, majority of uh, Muslim communities around the world. But in the West, of course, anti-Semitism is, is not at all, at least officially acceptable. We'll have someone speaking in a couple of weeks about Britain and we get a different view of that. But my point is simply that there seems to be an, an equilibrium where it actually serves the purposes of the Iranian government to treat the Jews reasonably well in Iran, reasonably well, because it makes it much easier for them to be arch-critical of anything that Israel does or anything that Israel doesn't do. And, and just as sort of a side on that, if I think of some of the other minorities in Iran, like the Baha'i, for example, my suspicion would be that they are much worse off and one of the reasons that they're much worse off is that unlike the Jews of Iran, there's no counterbalancing force. There's nothing that's really forcing the Iranian government to be nice to the Baha'i uh, population uh, in Iran. They, 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 you know, they, they, where, where, where would the Baha'i go, for example? What, what's the counterpoint to Israel as for Jewish population? So, so, that's the, the, so I guess the, the two the questions are twofold. One is whether or not you agree with this idea that part of this has to do with growing the leadership and Muslim world overall. And, and the second thing is to one of the reasons why the Jews might be better off relative to the Baha'i population is because they have to treat the Jews nicely in order to be more critical of Israel. And with the Baha'i, there's nothing to lose. Well, I'm not sure I would agree with the second part, but certainly I agree with the first part. Okay. I would even go to the extreme and say that in many ways, the animosity towards Israel helps the Islamic revolution. It's a revolution that really did not, has not been successful in the in delivery. Well, I, I'm saying that the side that I don't think the revolution was about return to Islam. Life was miserable and people followed Ayatollah Khomeini with the hope that he would bring them to the promised land, to success. Uh, and 29 years after, they asked themselves, what did we gain from this revolution? Mm -hmm. A revolution that did not deliver or did not meet the expectation, uh, it's good for them to find an enemy away from their borders. Israel is a convenient enemy. They don't fight Israel. No Iranian soldier is fighting with Israel on the borders of Israel. They send others. They support others who fight Israel. So, and you are right that it serves their interests 
to find a place, to establish that place as a leading force in the Muslim world. And that's also about a nuclear issue. It's part of the same thing. If they want to be the leading Muslim country, you have to raise the flag of Jerusalem. Unfortunately, everyone who wants to be leader in the Arab world, in the Muslim world, would somehow come to the Jews or to Jerusalem. You know, Saddam Hussein invaded Iraq. He was going totally to different direction, and he said that the way to Jerusalem goes to Tehran. He sent his army to the opposite side and claiming that the way to Jerusalem goes to Tehran. Why? Because it's a symbol of raising this issue of Jerusalem and the name of Jerusalem is became so important. The same is being done today by the Iranians. They speak in the name of Jerusalem, they speak about the Palestinian issues. And there are some people who ask the question in Iran, what do we have with the Palestinian issue? Why we have become more Palestinian than the Palestinians? Abdullah Nouri, who was the first minister of interior of Khatami, who went to jail, of course, after what he said, he asked the question, why we have become, there is a Persian phrase, saying, why should the dish be warmer than the soup? When you have a hot soup, the plant is not warmer. Or I think in America they say, why someone has become more pious than the pop? If the Palestinians are dealing with the Israelis, why we in Iran, he is a religious man, this Abdallah Nouri, and he say, religiously speaking, what moral right do I have to tell them to go to war and not to make peace? The danger of Iran, you know, Charles asked before about, about Iran, is that Iran cannot contribute positively to developments in the Middle East, but it can war against peace in case Israeli and the Palestinians would choose to go on this path. Unfortunately, right now, we are spoiling these chances ourselves, Israelis and Palestinians. We, are not, we don't need the Iranian influence to disrupt peace process between us and the Palestinians. But in case there will be a serious peace, the Iranians can very easily disrupt it. So it's ideology or use of other means uh, in the service of ideology. Uh, it's, it's both of them. Now, Iran is a convenient. Now, do the animosity to the Jew, to Israel, necessitates balancing by not being anti-Jewish? I'm not sure about it. I think that there is a, a, a process of pragmatism upon taking power that they want to get rid, not to make enemy where there is no enemy. The Iranian Jews are faithful to the Iranian government. The Jews have learned the history to follow the current government. They pray for the government of the time, or the, for the well-being of the ruler. They pray for Khomeini, they now pray for Khamenei. There was a nice story that they were sharing with the cities, uh, all kind of bizarre things that going on in Iran. A few years ago, there was an Argentinian team who went to have a, prepare a movie on the Jews of Iran. And they were showing the uh, segments of it as an ad to Israeli television, and I was scared to death because I saw on the, uh, on the prayer table there, on the Shechal, there was a prayer for the well-being of the soldiers of Israel Defense Forces. It was 20 years after the revolution, and the Jews of Iran going to prayer, they had this prayer to the well-being of, of, the, of the soldiers. And I thought it's dangerous because these people in the synagogue don't know what it is. They, they think it's part of their, uh, I don't know, uh, prayer, the ordinary prayer. I tried to convince the television not to screen this part of the movie. And, and I was stupid. You know? I thought that I would convince them. And then they realized what an asset they have in hand. Of course they showed. They showed 20 times. But I mean, to me, the Jews of Iran, they don't really know much about it. About, about Judaism, unfortunately, and what is Judaism and what is uh, something else. But certainly the Muslims don't know much about, 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 about Judaism. But the, the, Jews of, uh, the Jews of Iran publish declaration to support the regime in Iran every, every other week. 
follow the leaders of the Iranian community, the representative of the Jews in the parliament, the leader of the Jewish community, you see this anti-Israeli statements being published. Well, I can understand them. What can I do? They live there. They have to, to, have to protect themselves. So uh, there is, the fact remains that they have more pragmatic attitude toward the religious minorities, including the Baha'is. The treatment today of the Baha'is is not similar to 25 years ago. They are much more uh, moderate in their attitude toward Baha'is. Does anybody else want to ask a question? Just motion to leave. If you are looking at a more of a approach to either a change of regime or change of policies, um, can you say something about the balance of power between the leader of the state, uh, the justice system, the parliament, the is there uh, any chance to change uh, something uh, in the way the system is? In the well, chances are always there. Uh, the question is if it will be uh, soon enough before Iran has nuclear energy. And I'm not sure. They usually uh, uh, describe it as two trains that already are out of the terminal, one carrying nuclear message and the other carrying the message of change of regime or, or policy change. Unfortunately, the train with nuclear energy is driving much faster. Uh, so, uh, change in of regime or change of policy is, I think, the best way to export the most, in my understanding, uh, I think that it would come ultimately from the people of Iran. They brought Ayatollah Khomeini to power, they brought this regime to power, and they will change the policy or change the regime. Iran is the only country in the Middle East which had constitutional revolution. Iran is the only country in the Middle East which has two big revolutions in the 20th century. The people are acting on the streets, the people are daring, the young people are uh, acting, and, and influential. You could see two or three months ago the president of uh, Ahmadinejad went to visit uh, Amir Kabir University. They put his pictures on fire in front of him. It doesn't happen in every non-democratic system that you know in history. So I think that uh, if you, you look for a venue for, for which change would come, it may come with, by the people of Iran. But uh, this kind of social changes are unpredictable and take time. It took a long time uh, to change realities in revolutionary countries elsewhere. Uh, and we cannot wait and see, okay, tomorrow, the day after. You know, one thing that historians cannot really tell you is when people start changing direction. After it happens, there will be very, you know, smart people who will come and tell you, we knew exactly when it was going to happen, we warned you. Believe me, don't believe them. No one knows when people, mass movement, start moving. Uh, we have seen many such developments in history, and there were not any, any pre signs that predicted that this is going to, to be going to happen. There are other ways to bring about a change in policy in Iran, is to, to speak with them and let them realize that they are going to pay a, pay a heavy price for their policy. I don't believe that there is any radical movement or state that is willing to commit suicide. They are open to this. They may be willing to pay higher price that you would regard uh, rational, but ultimately the Iranian regime doesn't want to commit suicide. Now you ask about the power system in Iran. In Iran, the supreme leader is not the president. In Iran, the supreme leader is the supreme leader is the highest religious authority. But, you know, even uh, this is not very, very clear. Khomeini was recognized, Ayatollah, that all people obeyed and followed him. When he passed away, there was no Ayatollah with such a calendar. You know, sometimes we, I think, the lack of understanding is, is, uh, 
surprisingly, uh, we speak, people speak about the Shiite crescent, as, as though all the Shiites are one entity. Well, they are not. When Khomeini came to power in 1979, the, the number one ayatollah in Iran, the highest ranking ayatollah in the country, was put under house arrest until he passed away seven years later. His name was Kazim Shariat Madari. One of the most prominent ayatollahs in Iran today, Ayatollah Montazari, who was chosen, has been chosen by Khomeini to be his successor, does not have freedom to preach his people. If you compare the chief Ayatollah of Iraq, Sistani, who is Iranian by origin, with Khamenei, you see two different worldviews. For Khamenei and Khomeini students to save the nation and to save the Islam, one should unify religion and state. For people like Sistani to save the nation and save Islam, you should separate between religion and state. This is a bold ideology are legitimate in Islam. The supreme leader is the highest authority. He is above all, uh, all powers. I mentioned the pragmatic element. Let me say about the radicals. The radicals, conservatives in Iran, have four main meaningful assets. First, they speak in the name of God. You know, in my region in the Middle East, when you wake up in the morning and tell the people what God exactly wants, you spoke with them last night, maybe, and you come and tell the people, the people, it's powerful. It has influence. It's also, you know, you don't have to go to the Muslim world. We have them in, among Jews in, in Jerusalem or Israel as well. So they have God on one side. They have the military on the other side. You know, if God is not enough, God forbid, he should be enough. But if he's not enough, there is the military. So if you have God on one side, the military on the other side, you speak in the name of God, it's powerful. The third element of strength that they have is that they are determined to fight for power. When there was a revolution against the Shah, he took his, his, his wife and four kids and left the country. The clerics don't have anywhere to live to. They will continue living there and struggling to maintain their power. And the fourth advantage that they have is that there is no opposition. There is not a valid uh, alternative ideology, viable ideology, to come against them. It's very difficult to come with ideology against Islam, Islamic Republic. But the problem is that there are oppositions, no opposition. They, the oppositions hate each other more than they hate the regime in Iran. There is not accepted, accepted leadership. There is no viable alternative ideology. And with this situation, this regime uh, can go, can go on. It doesn't mean that they can go forever. It means that it's given them strength compared to the other elements. The, the, the judiciary is under